Hello everybody, welcome back. So one week ago, we explained a method where we were gonna use the ARMA model from time series analysis to figure out on any given day, which stocks am I going to buy and then sell at the end of the day? That's exactly the method we've used for this entire past week, Monday through Friday. We got up early, early in the morning. We asked the model, which stock should I buy today? It told us we bought those stocks at the beginning of the day when the market opened, sold them at the end of the day, right before the market closed, and we wanna see what kind of positive or negative returns we made during those five days. And so, without further ado, let's take a look at what happened. Monday. So here we are getting this experiment started by looking at the three stocks that are recommended for us to buy on Monday. The first one is OKE, fit via a ARMA 4.0 model. This blue line you see here are the actual stock returns on any given day, and the black dash line is the ARMA model's prediction. It's not too surprising that it's predicting pretty well during the training period because it learned from that period in the first place. The real question is, does it perform well in the future? And so the future would be this next day here, Monday. It says that we're expecting a return of around 1%, but these error bars do extend a little bit below zero, but we see most of it is above zero. So we feel good about buying this stock. The next one is EWS. Very interesting that it's a reasonably complex ARMA model, ARMA 5.5. So you see the signature of the data and the predicted for the training period here. And you see also that maybe a little bit more of the window, the 95% confidence interval is actually below zero, but still most of it above zero. So we feel good about this one. And the last one is PSX. We see that probably even more of the predicted 95% interval is below zero, but most of it again is above zero. So we'll buy these three stocks on Monday. Hey folks, we just finished the first day of the experiment. We just sold the stocks from Monday and this is how we did compared to how we expected to do. So this chart here is showing the red dots as the actual return for the three ticker symbols we bought today. And these black bars are showing the confidence intervals, the 95% confidence intervals from the model before we bought the stocks. So for OKE, you see we were inside the interval and it was also positive, so that was great but the story is not as good for the other two. For EWS, we narrowly missed the interval and not in a good way. We missed it in the negative sense. And PSX was a pretty far miss on the interval. We thought it was gonna be positive most likely, but it ended up being negative and not even within the negative part of the interval that we thought it might be in. So overall today we invested $100 and we got a negative 0.8% return. We lost 80 cents today. Tuesday. These are the three predicted stocks for Tuesday. We see the first one is ITW, fit via a ARMA 5.0 model. We see that its 95% interval is well above zero, around 2%, which does seem rather high, even just looking empirically at this history here. So we'll be very curious if that actually does pan out or not. The next one is PSX, fit via a ARMA 8.0 model. So we see that the interval here is also positive, but just kind of barely. So we'll see, this seems a little bit more reasonable here. And the last one is PNW, a rather wide interval. So it is above zero, but it does seem within reasonable bounds for historical data for this ticker symbol. All right, let's see what happened on Tuesday. We got a positive return of plus 1.04%. So investing $100, we made a dollar and four cents today. And also on the accuracy front, we did better. So you see for the three stocks we bought today, two out of the three of their returns were actually in the 95% interval where we predicted it. And the last one, which was not, was a pretty narrow miss, but it was still positive. So looking better today than yesterday for sure. Wednesday. So these are the predicted stocks to buy on Wednesday. We see the first is IDX. We see the 95% interval is above zero. So feeling good about this one. The next one is BA, Boeing stock. We see that the 95% interval is even further up above zero. So feeling really good about this. Curious to see if this is accurate or not accurate because that's a pretty high percent return, honestly, around two to 3%. We also see this is a cool one because it's a rather complex ARMA model. It's an ARMA 9.4. And if you print out the significant coefficients of the model, there's many, many, many of them. And the final one is OKE, fit via a ARMA 4.0 model. And we see that most of its 95% interval is above zero with a little bit below. So we'll see how this one does as well. All right, here we are on hump day in the middle of the experiment, Wednesday. We got the most negative return we've seen so far. So we lost $1.33 today. And we also got some pretty big misses compared to the previous days. 
So for IDX, that was a positive. We got a positive return. It was within the interval we expected it to be. BA was just pretty much a complete disaster. So we expected it to be between 1% and 4% return. So there's something already weird going on, which we'll touch on more throughout this video, but 1% to 4% seems pretty crazy for a day, no matter which stock you're talking about, no matter which method you use to predict it. So something is being overestimated here. And we see what actually happened was actually a negative 2% return. For OKE, we mostly thought this was going to be positive with a small chance of negative, but even the part of the negative interval here that we expected did not capture what it actually was down here at more than negative 2%. So we lost a good amount of money today. Thursday. So we've got here the predictions for Thursday. So we see the first one is IBB predicted via a ARMA 5.5. One interesting thing with both this one and the next one, EWS, which is even more complicated, and ARMA 10.5, it seems like the predictions with these, this black dashed line here, even on the training period, aren't like that great. They generally follow the shape, but it seems kind of noisier than the previous days. So I'm not sure how much mileage we're going to get out of the fact that these two confidence intervals are positive here, but we shall see. And the final one here is PSX. I think we had this on a previous day as well. Um, a very similar issue here in ARMA 8.0, which is a reasonably complicated model, but it's not fitting too well to the training data. And on top of all that, not even all of this 95% predicted interval is above zero. So have a lot less hopes for what's going to happen on Thursday versus previous days. Here we are on Thursday on the penultimate day of this experiment, and we see some mixed results here. So we see the IBB was within the bounds. It was positive. We got a percent return there, so that was great. The EWS actually, surprisingly, well, I guess it's positive and negative. We actually exceeded what we thought we were going to get, which is good for the amount of money coming back into our bank account but bad in the sense that, well, the prediction was off still. We expected it to be between about a little bit above zero to maybe 1%, but it was actually 2%. So not predicted well, but at least it's good news on the return front. PSX, we narrowly made it inside of this predicted interval. Also, the predicted interval was just pretty huge for this compared to the others. And so also a great return here, 4% today. So yesterday was the worst day of the experiment, and today is the best day of the experiment too far. Made 2.3% or $2.30 today. Friday. So here we are on the final day of our trading, and we see this ticker gets recommended to us. And yes, I did say ticker and not tickers, because something interesting happened this day, which is that only one ticker, PSX, with a ARMA 10.0 model, got recommended, got past all of our filters. Nothing else did. We haven't explicitly talked about what to do in this situation, so we have a couple of options here. The first one is take the $100 allocated for this day and just put it all in PSX. That doesn't seem like a great idea because now we're putting a lot of money in this one ticker just because we have it, whereas in previous days we were diversifying, putting $33.33 only. Another idea would be relax our filters so more tickers do make it through, but then we risk contaminating our experiment because we weren't rigorous every day and we relax the assumptions for this day. And so what we're going to go with is we're going to go ahead and take the $33.33 and invest it in this ticker. And we'll just not consider the other money for this experiment. We'll just put it back in the bank. So we actually did have $67 and a little bit of change for the other two tickers had they been here, but they're not here. So really, in this experiment, overall, we only invested $433.33. Here we are on the final day of the experiment. As we said, we chose to only buy the one stock, which was returned by our method today. So not too much to look at, just invested $33.33 in PSX. And we did get within the interval, but we got within the negative part of the interval, unfortunately. And we lost a couple of cents here. One other thing, this PSX thing has come up a lot. It's come up on... One, two, three, four out of the five days that we ran this experiment. So one improvement to make for this whole experiment might be to think about, are we just investing in stocks over and over and over again? Maybe don't invest in a stock. If you already invested it in during this experiment or if it already did poorly, maybe you do invest in it if it has been doing well. So maybe some more nuanced considerations that are using learnings from the previous days to inform the current day. Of course, that means that we're not really having each day independent anymore. They're learning from each other, so it's a double-edged sword. So 
overall, how did we do? We definitely had positive and negative days. But da 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 da, overall, in this experiment, our return was 0.234%. And how much is that? So we invested $433.33 total. And if you take 0.234% gain on that, you make a dollar and one cent. So congrats, everyone. We made it. We made a dollar and one cent in this experiment. So in all seriousness, this probably is not significant enough of a return to say this experiment was an overwhelming success and we should use this method going forward. Well, we did it over five days. We didn't lose any money. I would consider this a pretty neutral outcome. We had some good days. We had some bad days. So still pretty cool to see and definitely an improvement over the last video. Now I want to dive into some deeper level analysis of this entire method and see where things went wrong and where things went right. And the first thing we'll look at is just looking at the predicted versus actual returns. So when we say predicted returns for each day, we're just saying the center of this 95% confidence interval. So for example, if you take the center of this PSX interval, it'll be somewhere around here, like 1%. And so that would be the predicted return for that day. And the actual return for this day, for example, was 4%. So let's take a look at all of the stocks we bought over all five days and take a look at the predicted versus actual returns to see if there's any pattern or not. So on the x-axis here, you have predicted returns. And on the y-axis here, you have actual returns. So this gray vertical line is zero. So notice the first thing is that all of the stocks that we bought had predicted return that were positive, And that is based on how our method worked in the first place. We only picked stocks whose predicted returns would be positive. That's why there's nothing to the left of this vertical line. Now this horizontal line here at zero is showing where the actual return would be zero. So negative things below this line would be where we had a negative return for those stocks and above this line would be a positive return for those stocks. So the first thing to note here is that we had eight ticker symbols. So there's eight dots who are above this horizontal zero line and five, only five dots that are below this actual return equals zero line. So if we're just purely counting the number of times we got a positive return, that is more on the positive side than the negative side. So that's a success in some sense. Now that's about the only good news on this chart. So this diagonal dashed line here you see is basically if we had a perfect prediction. So if the predicted return was exactly the actual return, then all of our dots would lie pretty much on this dashed line. And you see pretty much none of our dots lie on that dashed line. There's not even really a positive correlation here. Nothing to write home about. You see the closest we got was this day here, but in general, not getting too close with our predicted versus actual return. So we basically just reinforced what we already kind of knew going in that predicting the stock market is really, really hard. And maybe we'll use more complex methods, but still not the easiest thing to do. Now, the other negative thing on this chart is looking at the amount of times we over predicted the stock's return versus the amount of times we under predicted the stock's return. So on this plot here, anytime you see a dot below this diagonal dashed line, that is a over prediction because that's saying that, hey, there's some predicted return here, but the actual return was lower than the predicted return. So we over predicted. We thought it was gonna do better than it actually ended up doing. Conversely, if you look at dots that are above this diagonal line, then those are under predictions because that's saying given some predicted return, the actual return was actually higher. So we actually did even better than we were expecting to do. And you see that by and large, 11 of these 13 dots are over predictions where we predicted some return, but the actual return ended up being lower than that. Now, whether this method is accurate or not is one thing, but something that's arguably worse is that it's biased in this direction. If we had about an equal number of dots above and below the line, we could at least say that, well, this method isn't accurate, but it's over predicting just as much as it's under predicting. So we can say some hand wavy argument about things canceling out. But the bad thing here, even though some of these over predictions do end up still being positive returns, which would be all these ones that I'm highlighting here, there's still the matter that our method is just thinking things are going to go a lot better than they actually would go. And I started thinking about, well, why would this happen? Why would there be a bias in this direction? And then I started thinking about, well, there's probably some or a lot of selection bias at play, 
with how we chose stocks in this method. So think back to how we chose the stocks for any given day. After passing through the filters of at least a certain number of days where we were able to fit an ARMA model, and also passing the filter of the predicted 95% interval usually containing the true return, we ranked the resulting stocks descending by what fraction of their predicted interval was above zero. And that's exactly how we got all of these chosen stocks for every day. These were chosen because most or all of their 95% predicted interval was above this zero horizontal line. So you see here on Monday, most of those are above the zero line. On Tuesday, all of them are above the zero line. Same thing on Wednesday and so on and so on. But by using this criteria, which we meant as a way to only pick the things where we were the most confident, we may have also induced a selection bias. Because now we're also picking the stocks whose predicted returns are the highest according to the model. And those may be the result of not actually having a good predicted return the next day, but could be something more nefarious, something that we try to deal with in machine learning, but maybe didn't deal with too well in this method, overfitting. By only picking the tickers whose predicted interval was really far above zero, maybe we were picking things that were unrealistically above zero, where it just fit too well to the training data and gave us some nonsense prediction that this stock is gonna give you a 3% return tomorrow, but because it was such a poorly fit model that's not gonna to generalize to tomorrow, we actually ended up getting this case where a lot of times it was predicted way under where we expected it to actually be. So there may be a pretty big selection bias in this whole process, evidenced by the fact that most of these dots are actually over predictions. If we truly had a method that didn't have any bias for the negative or positive side, we would see about an equal number of dots, even though there's not too many dots here, 11 out of 13 still seems like a pretty big evidence of over prediction, selection bias, overfitting going on. Now the next thing I wanna do is put a little bit more into context how this method did versus some really stupid, basic, obvious methods. And the most basic one we can think of here, if we had to invest in something, is just investing in the S&P 500. If I just took these $433.33 and just threw it into the S&P 500, at the beginning of Monday and just let it sit there until the end of Friday, would I have made more money? Would I have made less money? Would I have made about the same amount of money as I did in this experiment? So let's take a look here. Here you're seeing the stock price of the S&P 500 throughout about the last month or so. And there's a couple of things that I've highlighted here. So the second vertical line here is when the experiment started. So everything to the right of this is the tenure of our experiment. Now, another thing I wanted to do in this follow-up video was look at a couple of contextual things that were going on in the economy because we run these methods whenever, but there's always some macroeconomic stuff that we should at least background be aware of, even if our method that we chose doesn't actually rely on that information. And the biggest macroeconomic thing going on in this time frame was the collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank, or SVB. In a nutshell, what happened was that a state-chartered, very large bank called Silicon Valley Bank collapsed on March 10th, 2023. And that, as you might have expected, drove a lot of investors into a panic around, well, our financial system's not strong, this is really bad news. And so between March 10th and our experiment starting, the S&P 500, which again tracks the health of the overall market, really took a nosedive. So it went down pretty sharply here. Now, when our experiment started, the S&P 500 was in a pretty negative state compared to what was happening before. But people started seeing this as an overreaction. And I'm not just speculating. I'm looking at some articles here to say that, well, this is probably why we saw the rise in the S&P 500 that we did during the week of our experiment. So looking back at what happened right when our experiment started, well, people maybe realized that this drop, this sell-off of the S&P 500 was maybe an overreaction and therefore gained a little bit of trust back into the market, into the entire financial institution system. And therefore, the S&P 500 actually rose pretty significantly during our experiment. And what that means is that if we had just put all of the money allocated for this experiment instead into the S&P 500 in the beginning of Monday and then just let it sit there until the end of Friday, we would have made a 2.1% return. Folks, that is 10 times higher than the return we actually made in this experiment. So even though when we were looking back here at what the average return was in the experiment, we said, hey, it's positive, that's better than before. Well, it actually doesn't seem so great compared to what you would have made if you just invested in the entire market and didn't have to go through all this work of every day running this model and then buying the stocks it tells you to and then selling them at the end of the day. It just seems like all that work is not worth 
not making as much money, making 10 times as less money in this experiment. So it's always good to compare whatever method you run against the overall market because your method might be positive, but if the market is like 10 times more positive, then eh, you basically failed. So this method I would actually consider a failure and not a success if you compare it to what would have happened if you just invest in the overall market. Now the last thing I wanna talk about in this video is a improvement which we subtly mentioned in the previous video but which I really think would be an improvement now that I look at some stocks that did not make into this experiment because we ruled them out earlier in the method. And so one thing I was doing was, hey, let me just spot check some other stocks that I was surprised maybe didn't show up. And one of those was Microsoft stock. So I was a little surprised that Microsoft stock didn't get included in our experiment at all, especially when I look at this price chart of Microsoft stock over the last month. So our experiment starts here on Monday, March 13th, and it ends here on Friday, March 17th. And the growth rate of Microsoft stock in that period is 10%. And not only overall is it 10%, but if you look at any given day, it's positive on any given day of our experiment. So I was like, wait, why didn't our models pick up on Microsoft stock if it's doing so well? And then I remembered, oh, duh, we're using an ARMA model. And something we called out before was that if we had used a ARIMA model, which is able to fit to these kind of trends who are showing a positive or negative trend over your training data, then we would not have run into the problem of throwing stocks like this out early when we were checking for stationarity. And to prove that to myself, I plotted these Microsoft stock returns during a training window and showed that if you run the augmented Dickey Fuller test on it, it shows that it is not stationary. And you can even see that it's visually not stationary because one of our conditions for stationarity, remember, was that it has no positive or negative trend over time. And if you look at these Microsoft stock returns, well, there certainly seems to be somewhat of a positive trend over time. So it totally makes sense why it wasn't brought up as a candidate by our experimental method, but it's also a complete shame that it wasn't brought up as a candidate. Because by not using an ARIMA method, by sticking to an ARMA model, you're explicitly ignoring those stocks whose returns are strong, are getting stronger and stronger over time. And by throwing those out, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot because you're only including stocks who are sometimes above zero, sometimes below zero, but not ones that are consistently going up, consistently positive. So if we ran this experiment again, one improvement I would definitely make is changing the ARMA to an ARIMA. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say in this review video. So overall, I would say we did better than before. We definitely got a, I would say flat, not positive return. We pretty much kept the amount of money we had constant throughout this experiment but still a failure compared to what we could have made if we just invested in the market, laid back and just let our money grow by about 2% for the entire experiment. So if you notice something else in these charts or some analysis that I missed, please post them in the comments below. I love taking a look at what happened after the fact and seeing things we missed, things that seem so obvious when you were designing the method, but then when you look at the results, you say, oh my God, how did I miss that? How did I not think of that? So if you had any of those moments, any of those realizations when you were watching this video, please, please post them in the comments below. When we think about this series of stock trading strategies, I really do rely on your input to think of things that I didn't address in one video, which we can improve for the next video. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. And I will see you all next time.